they're going to up the prominence of atrocities committed by someone like Saddam Hussein, who they have an interest in being at odds with, but they're going to downplay the actions. This is the Illegitimate Scholar Podcast, where we think that our culture is in crisis and don't trust woke universities to explain how and why. I'm Sam, and I quit teaching history because I love the content, but hated the limits on what and how I could teach. In this podcast, you'll hear stories in history, anthropology, culture, and geopolitics that make you rethink what you were taught in schools. Um, today, how do we decide what genocides we care about? So some genocides are discussed more than others. What genocides get the most attention? Why do they? Uh, why do many genocides get ignored over others? What metrics are used to judge genocides? And does this allow for more genocides to occur? How do genocides continue to occur because of how they're viewed? Okay. So I'm going to start this off with a story about my fucking childhood that's entirely relevant. Um, so when I was younger, I used to live in uh, Indonesia, which is in Asia. And uh, so when I was like 10 or 11 years old, my dad brought me to a very fun place. So we used to travel a lot and, and go to fun locations that I was thrilled to go to at 11 years old, like temples. Um, it's probably why I am doing what I do now. But at the time, I wanted to go to Disney World. And instead, I was going to some dumb fucking Buddhist temple that I didn't give a shit about. So... Uh, so we went to the killing fields in Cambodia, the fucking killing fields. They, they're what they sound like. They're a bunch of fields where uh, a bunch of Cambodians in the 70s uh, killed a bunch of other Cambodians for the crimes of dealing with uh, the old government. Um, you know, you had glasses that killed you because you got given them by the old government. Um, pretty bad. I think it killed like a third of the population. Um, I didn't know about this at the time. We went to this place. Um, there was a mountain of skulls, um, or a pyramid of skulls, rather. A real pyramid of skulls, real life skulls. Cambodia is like, you know, it's like uh, Thailand's Mexico, uh, you might call it. We had a guide who was just a guy who survived the fucking genocide. Um, he got very emotional during it, um, during during the tour and he does this every fucking day um and you know that was upsetting to me i'm like god damn like this guy went through this horrible fucking thing um horrible freaking thing yeah uh brady asked me to swear less um so i'm gonna try to swear less because brady's got two young little little children um so i'm gonna swear less for brady i'm gonna try my best we'll see um cambodia so uh, cambodian killing fields you know, we're out there in these fields and this guide points to what he tells us is a baby's bone where they used to smash babies on the trees. You know, God, I got to do content warning. My whole podcast is a content warning. I am a walking content warning. So I'll just walk up to you at a bar and start talking about genocide. Um, yeah, so smashing babies on trees, man. Not cool. Not cool at all. You can't fucking do that. It's not right. Um, but the bones like just there, like they didn't clean the shit up. They just put it there. It's behind like police caution tape. That's like drooping down because it's old. This shit's crazy. There was like very few regulations. And then we go to this thing, this place that was a former school that then was turned into a, a concentration camp for future victims of this genocide. Um, and, uh, we went to this fucking school um, and like there was still blood on the walls, like from where they had beaten people and they were bleeding on the walls and they tried to bleach it and clean it off. Um, I guess they didn't think to add another coat of paint maybe on top, uh, maybe get some new drywall, probably don't use drywall over there, whatever they're using, but instead they just leave it there. And it's not like, you know, it's not like there's a room blocked off and like you have glass to look through and look at the wall. No, like you could touch the shit. I mean, I didn't, that's some bad juju, but like it's right there. And there's not even a sign telling you not to touch it. I, I don't even remember if there was a marker for it. And there's all these pictures of the people that got killed. It's 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 wild. Um, it was horrifying. It was absolutely horrifying. And I, I argue that I probably was too young to be taken to that location. Um, and it's ingrained in my memory. It was it was, to be honest, it was a little bit traumatic. Um, but the point of all that is that. I never heard of it before. I heard of it about it only because I was living in Asia. Um, a third of the population of the of the people um, in Cambodia were killed, a third to a half. Um, and I, it happened in the 1970s. It happened after World War II. My understanding up to that point was like, you know, the genocide in... I, I had heard about the genocide in Rwanda because at that point, 
you know, this is the early 2000s. It had just happened. There was that movie Hotel Rwanda that had come out and I watched it. Um, wish I hadn't. Uh, but my dad likes stuff like that. Um, so, uh, and I knew about the Holocaust. I didn't know the details, but I knew about it. Um, and I thought the Holocaust was just the most evil thing to ever happen. And, uh, you know, it's up there. It's definitely up there. I, I'm not going to say what I think is the worst. I don't really have an opinion on what's the worst. But what I didn't realize is that there was like a hundred other holocausts that happened at varying points in history. And the most alarming thing about this to me was that, you know, I thought America was this beacon of hope that would stop things like this from happening. And I remember, I remember thinking like when this was happening, why didn't the American government stop it? And uh, uh, the only people who actually came in and, and helped a little bit, they didn't, they did more than anyone else, but the, the freaking, um, the Vietnamese, the, the Viet Cong or the, um, the North Vietnamese army. I, I don't remember which, I mean, maybe both, they came in and they, they kind of fucked with Khmer Rouge a little bit. Um, they didn't stop it entirely, but I think they did save a few people. Um, the, as far as I know, that's the only ones that came in internationally. And I, and I was just like, what the hell, man? Like, why, why didn't we do anything about that? Why didn't we do anything about that? Why were we in Vietnam? There's no genocide in Vietnam. Later on, I learned about the Gulf of Tonkin incident and false flags and Dow Chemical and all this stuff, you know, and, you know, the military industrial complex is really why we go to war, not actually to, to help people. But, uh, you know, I remember going to middle school and we learned about the Holocaust and I, you know, I knew about the Holocaust, but like people were talking about the, the Holocaust, like even the teacher was talking about it, like these other things hadn't happened. I remember being set off when I was in middle school by someone saying like, this should never happen again. And I was like, it's happened. It's happened since the Holocaust. And I remember, I don't remember her name, but my language arts teacher, um, because of the, the way I was responding, clearly I was upset about this. Um, you know, I try to figure it out. And, you know, I, I came to the realization, honestly, that, you know, Americans, and this is an oversimplification, but Americans don't really care about Asian people. They don't care about Southeast Asian people, especially. They might care about Japanese people, especially today, you know, because they're closer to us in you know economic cultural ties and shit um but y how are you gonna get an american to care about a freaking laotian or a uh or a cambodian mm, it's not gonna happen there ain't shit there you can't even point to it on a map most americans uh, you know not that the europeans are much better but you know it's it's just not relevant to our everyday lives and our regular culture korea japan china and you know uh, those ones are, are prominent in America um, and, and the Philippines because of the close cultural ties. But other than that, you know, Asians just, who gives a f is the general sentiment of most Americans, I think. But I digress. Um, yeah, people were saying never again. And I'm like, look, it's fucking happened. It happened in the 90s in Africa. Do we just not care about Africans? Yeah, that's the point. We just don't care about Africans. You know, we care about white people most of the time. Um it depends. So, um, you know, this happened in middle school and college. It comes back up, man. I mean, it, it came up in high school, too, but it came up really in college um, because, you know, I was doing history education and getting a history degree, social studies education. And my professor, who was a guy who, who really did not like me very much um, and who I think acted inappropriately and who I, in my own right, I antagonized him at certain points. I believe justifiably, but regardless, you know, he didn't like me. And at one point he accused me of anti-Semitism, but uh, I'm not anti-Semitic. Um, I don't, well, I'm not a self-identified anti-Semite. I am whatever you say I am. So if you decide you want me to be an anti-Semite in your own mind, then I can exist in your mind as an anti-Semite. Um, but what I am really is a person who cares about all human beings on this planet, uh, regardless of their race, religion, creed, ethnicity, whatever it is. And I want to get to the bottom of why genocides are still happening and why there's probably one happening in China right now. And yet we don't give a shit. That's what I'm here for. That's what this is about. It's not about, you know, saying, oh, the Holocaust isn't as bad as other genocides. Like the Holocaust wasn't a big deal because all these other things happened. No, it's the opposite of that. It's holy. F the Holocaust is horrifying. Look at all these other times that very similar shit happened. Holy f the Holocaust happened a hundred times in the last hundred years. I don't know, may, maybe not that many times, but Jesus Christ, it's bad out there, people. It is bad. You look at the Holocaust 
and you see how bad it is? And you know, that happened in Cambodia. It happened in Armenia. It's happening to the Uyghur Muslims in China right now. And nobody gives a shit. Well, they give a shit. Some people give a shit. Not the right people give a shit. And they're not positioned in the right way to be able to do anything about this. Um, so these people in college that I'm talking to, some of which, um, you know, really put the Holocaust in this place of prominence above under genocides, which I think is a real issue. And to be fair, most of my classmates were very supportive of me on this. Um, but, you know, the professor, not so much. So I got paper here. I, I looked at and just to confirm, to have a metric of understanding that the Holocaust is discussed over other genocides. I, I got some some Google Trends stats here and I'm, you know, uh, so on Google Trends, the Holocaust, I'm looking at um, a graph that compares them over the last year and never once is the Holocaust not the most common out of the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, the Cambodian genocide, and the Rwandan genocide. And these are all the Armenian genocide, early 20th century, Holocaust, 1940s, Cambodian genocide, 1970s, Rwandan genocide, 1990s. So the Holocaust at any point on Google is the most common topic of discussion with any of these. It's, it's not even close. It's not even close. It's like out of 100, if the Holocaust is 100, everything else is 2, 1, less than 1. At certain points, it spikes to maybe a 4 compared to the, to the highest discussion of the Holocaust. And this is important because it's, it, it's how much the Holocaust exists in our um, collective consciousness. And that's not a bad thing. We should be talking about the Holocaust, but the problem is that when the Holocaust is is discussed so much more than other ones, it becomes the quintessential genocide, and it makes people it makes people think that like it allows people to believe that this hasn't happened or the other ones haven't been as bad because when people think of genocide, they think Holocaust a lot of the time. I mean, I personally do. And then when the details of another genocide don't exactly match that one, it and they don't talk about them as much, it makes it pretty easy to just push them out of your head. And that's the problem. The problem is not that we shouldn't be talking about the Holocaust, to be clear. Um, maybe if I had a more popular show, somebody would take that shit out of context and be like, oh, this guy doesn't want to talk about the Holocaust. Yeah, go f*** yourself. Sorry, Brady. Um, okay. So... All, like learn about this in college, seeing how other how the professor only wanted to fucking talk about the Holocaust. And when I brought up, hey, let's talk about another genocide. I think we talk about the Holocaust too much. And I think that that has the effect of making it seem like this is what a genocide is. And these other genocides aren't real. And I had brought up Native American genocide because I think that's a very comparable one. It's also one that's culturally very close to the United States. I came up with my own metrics to decide what genocides are cared about more than other genocides. So there are three of these. So the first reason is cultural connection to Americans in prominence. There's a large minority of um, Jewish people in positions of prominence in the United States, as well as other people who want to discuss the Holocaust. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's good that minority groups in a country get representation and can put forward their own issues. But the fact is that while Jewish Americans and Native Americans are both 2% of the U.S. population, uh, Jewish people have a lot more cultural capital and ability to, like, uh, to advocate for their own issues in uh, in the culture. And this is because they um, are in positions of prominence, um, slightly above their, um, their 2% of the population. Like, I'm not saying there's conspiracy here that the Jews are controlling everything. What I am saying is that there are enough Jews, a few percent of them, in prominent positions, which allows them to push what helps them in their community, whereas Native Americans are not in as many of those prominent roles. There's like uh, Jewish people are 2% of the U.S. population. They're like 6% of Congress. So still a very low percentage, but um, but overrepresented versus their 2% population. Whereas um, Native Americans are much less than 2% of Congress. They have much less representation in Congress. They have less representation in large companies. But people will push for things that help their community. I mean, this is really why... You would say, and and I agree with the idea that the United States was and you know has remnants of structural racism in it as things were pushed for the whites, specifically white elites, for a very long time, and that's because of their ability to get their ideas passed. 
so things could happen. And, and this is what happens with uh, Jewish people in America because they're able to exert cultural capital. And again, that's a good thing that minority groups can represent their own views. It's just that I want Native Americans to be able to have their views and their needs represented in the country as well. We should be saying all of these things are unacceptable, all of the different methods of it. Because when you look at the Holocaust and you say, this is the worst one ever, these ones aren't as bad, you're allowing for more of them to happen because you're you're allowing people an out where they can say where they can find evidence that says it's not happening just like the Holocaust. So it's not as bad. It's OK. It's it's, it's not that it's at least not to that. Um, and so much in human culture has to do with uh, something being not something else. Like it's a, it's, it's a world of contrasts. Okay. There, you don't have good without bad. You, you don't have evil without good. Okay. You, you need evil to have good because if there's no evil to contrast with the good, then the good is nothing. It's just neutral. So there has to be a comparison to be made. And the Holocaust is used as an academic tool by people who want to push their own agendas of making the most money. Like, you know, corporations that do business with China, they're not, and individuals that do business with China, they're not going to criticize China because they have money to lose. You know, they're not going to fucking do it. Whereas there's, you know, nobody benefits. Um, yeah. So the side of the organization, the side of the organization that is committing these atrocities. So for example, um, if a genocide happening or any other atrocity happening helps the U.S. government's position, they will boost the prominence of that, okay? So when Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine, which they fucking are, war just involves war crimes, especially one of these wars, when Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine, they're going to boost the prominence of those war crimes and they're going to, um, using propaganda, expand the scope of those war crimes and what's happening. They're going to downplay the war crimes committed by the Ukrainians on the Russians. They're going to downplay both them happening and they're going to downplay like, well, it wouldn't happen if they didn't invade, things like that. They're just going to downplay it. Similarly, they're, the U.S. government is going to upplay the atrocity. They're going to up the prominence of atrocities committed by someone like Saddam Hussein, who they have an interest in being at odds with, but they're going to downplay the actions of a country like Saudi Arabia that they benefit from geopolitical position because they need Saudi Arabia. So they're not going to criticize Saudi Arabia and they're going to, in fact, fund a Saudi-led genocide in Yemen, which is what's happening right now. So in all of these, when there is a genocide that's happening or an atrocity that's happening, if it helps organizations, individuals, people, then it's going to be discussed more. If it serves the geopolitical interest of the United States, they're going to talk about it more. If it serves the geopolitical interest of the United States to downplay an atrocity or a genocide, they're going to downplay it. The third one is how the U.S. academic establishment promotes ideas and research. So if the, if it's you have to do facts with peer-reviewed research and things like that, then the only facts that you can use are from prominent people that have to do it. These large organizations, they have to actually perform the research. They have to fund the research. So if there's no research and there's no money and there's no journalists going over because they can't, they're not being funded by their organization or the independent journalists aren't funding themselves, something like Rwanda just doesn't get reported on there's a lack of evidence whereas when there's something else like there's a lot of funding for holocaust research which finds all of this evidence because there's there's so much of it in the academic the u.s academic establishment certain ideas are going to get studied more in the journalistic establishment certain stories are going to be studied more because of the leanings either of those reporters or of those scientists or of those researchers and of the greater need of those organizations and who those organizations serve so you know in the case of like social media they're Twitter is in contact with the FBI and they're going to squash a story that makes Biden look bad right before the election and then they won't call it election interference, but whatever. 
So in college, I questioned the term Holocaust and genocide studies. I thought that it should just be genocide studies because I was saying that when you make the Holocaust separate, like I discussed, when you make the Holocaust separate, you have the Holocaust and genocide studies, and it puts the Holocaust in a position of prominence, which allows for people to find a way around calling other human rights violations and massive genocides, genocides. So in U.S. academia, the prominence of, of making the Holocaust, the Holocaust and genocide studies, number one, it makes people think that this is how a genocide is done. It's done through like people being rounded up. Uh, crystal knocked happens. They, they break the shops. They, they make these laws where they're like, they're Jewish people can't do certain things. They have to wear a star of David. There's, there's a, there's a buildup. There's a specific buildup that then leads in to uh, being moved on trains, being put in camps, being gassed, and it gives a blueprint. But the methods that the Nazis used to carry out this genocide on Jewish and Polish and gay and Romani people, these were culturally informed ideas. The, the Germans, they're an industrious and bureaucratic people, okay? When they did a genocide, they did it very systematically. They had trains, they used chemicals, um, it was based on the German culture. The way that cultures are carried out is culturally informed, which is crazy. The Nazis, they used trains to move people. They used gas to kill people. The Rwandans, they had a bunch of machetes. So they killed like a million people with machetes. It's horrifying. And that's a culturally informed thing because the Rwandans, they didn't have a lot of trains. They didn't have a large bureaucracy. So they just used machetes and they killed all these people. It's insane. And disgusting and horrifying and terrible. Um, the Ustase, the freaking guys that were murdering Muslims in Yugoslavia in the 90s, they used guns. Uh, the Irish on a secluded island, the British used fucking famine. They re And you can argue with me on this one, but it fits the UN definition. They used starvation. They removed the British Empire removed food sources from Ireland while the plight was happening, even though there was enough food to feed people because they redistributed from Ireland to England and other places. They, they just took the food and millions of people died. Um, the never again slogan, you see this a lot. You, you see the never again about the Holocaust a lot. And every time I see that, I just, it fills me with fear because when you say never again about the Holocaust, you're saying that it hasn't happened and that you don't want it to ever happen again, but it is happening right now. There is genocides right now, multiple in Yemen, in China, in Myanmar, there are genocides happening. And when you push, this is what happens when you push the Holocaust to a level of prime of prominence above other genocides, other genocides are able to be denied because they don't look exactly like that one. And that is not what we should do, be doing. We should be saying that none of these are acceptable. People around the world should not be being treated like that, regardless of how positively it affects Halliburton's bottom line. Academia creates ways of judging these events and ways of not producing research on them. Who's going to fund the research on Yemen right now? No one's going to fund the research because it doesn't benefit them. The bottom line is that social constructs and the way they view and promote certain ways of thinking about past events allow for these atrocities to continue.